Right, so pressure relieving equipment. What do you need to know about pressure relieving equipment? Lots of things, probably. Um, what to order? How do you decide what you are um, is right for your patient's needs um, and what you're going to be ordering? Um, how do you make that decision? How do you actually go ahead and order it? Um, how do you decide upon how urgent it is? Um, and what are your responsibilities as a prescriber? And where on earth do you go to for help about equipment? I would hope by the end of this session that we will have covered all of that and, and um, you will be able to um, answer those questions. Okay, so before we go on to look at equipment, I just wanted to have a conversation about um, uh, what we're talking about here and why are we ordering equipment? So this is all about those pressure areas and where the body comes into contact with surfaces. Now, the main things that come to mind is, well, when you're lying in bed, you come into contact with the bed. So the surface there would be the mattress. But there are other areas that you need to take into consideration. So when you're lying in bed, if you've got really heavy sheets and poor circulation in your feet, then your toes will be at risk. And the surface there would be the blankets or the duvet against your toes. Something on the back of your head, it might be the surface is your pillow rather than the mattress. Um, and the same goes for when you're sitting. Um, it's not just the, the chair on the, the seat area that you make contact with when you're sitting. Um, where else does your body make contact with? It may be arms on the armrests of a chair. It may be elbows if somebody with COPD is leaning over onto a table. It may be elbows on a table. Um, it may be if somebody's got a curvature of the spine that there is um, a significant contact with the backrest of the chair. Um, and of course, it's not just seating and beds. There's all the other things that sort of like come with it. So if somebody's elevating their legs on a footstool, it could be heels on a footstool. Um, medical devices, it could be oxygen tubing round the ears. It could be a CPAP mask um, on the face. It could be PPE for people in, in um, uh, ITU. That Some of the nurses in ITU with the, 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 the tight fitting masks that they have, they've been having issues with pressure damage and have needed some equipment to try and help prevent the pressure damage there. Um, it can be things like neck braces. I don't know if anybody's ever seen anybody that's had pressure damage on the, the bottom of their chin or, or um, on their scapula and things. So don't just think of mattresses and cushions, and I think a lot of people do think now of heels as well, but you need to think of all of the other areas where the body comes into contact with the surface when you are thinking about, do you need to assess that and is some equipment required? Okay. So you're not just looking at, um, their pressure uh, damage risk when you're thinking about equipment. That is the first thing that comes into mind. Um, you know, what is their risk of pressure damage and what's the appropriate equipment of that? But there are many other things that you need to consider as well. You need to be looking at somebody's environment. Um, I'm sure district nursing wise, you've come across lots of people where there is no room for a bed downstairs and they can't get upstairs and they're sitting in a chair and sleeping in a chair there. Um, so you need to be looking at somebody's environment to think about the equipment um, and whether that's going to sort of fit in. It may be that there's an adaptation to the environment that you need to make um, before even thinking about a piece of equipment. Um, so do consider the environment. And um, posture is really, really important. I think before I joined the team, I, I, I hadn't understood just how important looking at how somebody sits in a chair how they lie in bed, you know, at what their posture is um, um, before thinking about um, uh, what piece of pressure relieving equipment might be necessary um, or what I need to do about that posture before putting a piece of um, pressure relieving equipment in, uh, in place. Um, so do, you know, look at your patients. How are they lying in bed? Are they sitting up in bed? Are they slumped? Are there shearing forces there? Is there something you can do about their posture to remove the forces that would be creating um, pr pressure damage, not just putting a piece of equipment in? So the classic one is somebody who can't lie flat is at 45 degrees degrees in the bed and all that shearing and friction force and they're not turning on their sides and the direct pressure, they end up getting pressure damage on the bottom. But there's something that you could do perhaps to improve that by using the four section bed and bringing the, the knees up 
that might reduce the shearing and the friction of the patient um, as you're preventing them from sliding down the bed. So there may be something that you can do posture wise to improve their situation. You may need equipment as well, but you certainly need to be looking at the posture um, beforehand. And with that, does the piece of equipment that I'm thinking about um, have any um, impact on these sorts of things, on the, uh, the ergonomics of the present equipment um, and somebody's sort of like posture? So they, somebody may have a good posture in a chair, but you stick a 10 centimetre cushion on top of that and suddenly the chair's too high, their knees are hanging lower than their hips, you've lost that 90 degree angle and you've now encouraged them to slump down the chair and the shearing and um, uh, friction to, to come into place when it wasn't a problem before. Sometimes when you're looking at equipment, you've got a, um, a toss up between different priorities. So, for example, um, people who struggle to move in bed, maybe somebody with um, a paralysis or, um, uh, or a stroke, uh, may struggle to move in bed and you are keen for them to remain as independent as possible. And if you put a full dynamic mattress underneath them, it makes it more difficult for somebody to move in bed. So you may be having to look at compromising between function and pressure relief. So do I need to try and find a piece of equipment that is firmer but still meets their pressure relieving needs rather than just instantly putting in a full dynamic mattress. Um, so there's a number of things that you need to take into consideration um, when you're when you're looking at, at those things. And you're choosing your equipment. So. Before you choose what you're having, you need to look at what people have to start with. So what bed are they in? Um, what size is it? What condition is it in? What do they need? Do they need um, something of a different height? Um, can they move? Um, will a mattress go on top of it? If you've got somebody in a, in a double bed, that will impact on the sort of equipment that you can put on top of it. So you need to be thinking, uh, not just assessing the patient, but assessing you know, the equipment that's around them. So have a good look at the bed and think about what impact that will have on what sort of equipment you will be ordering. Likewise, chairs. So you need to be uh, looking at somebody's posture when they're sitting, but also assessing the chair that they are sitting in. Is this contributing to some of the problem? Is the chair too high? If the chair is too high, you're not going to be able to get that nice right angle posture, which means there's no shearing and friction forces in place. Um, if the, the back is too far back, they may lean back and they may need more back support. Um, if the chair um, has got a very wide seat and you're looking to put a cushion in, it may be that um, it's not suitable because the cushion will move around in the chair and you need to be looking at the dimensions of the seat when you're, you're selecting um, a cushion. Uh, one of the important things as well is, um, you know, if it's a riser recliner chair, um, is somebody using the riser function of the chair? If they're using the riser function of a chair independently, you have to be very careful about what cushion you put in. You put something heavy in there and they stand with the riser function and there's nobody there. The cushion can fall out, hit them on the back of the legs um, and cause a fall. Um, if they've got poor posture in a riser recliner chair, they can slide off the top of the cushion. So you need to be very careful about assessing the chair, its size, their posture within it and the suitability for the equipment that you might be thinking about putting in. A word whilst we're on the subject of riser recliner chairs, we often get lots of referrals for riser recliner chairs to our service and yes, in some rare circumstances, we would authorise and fund a riser recliner chair from the Tissue Viability Equipment Fund. We have very specific criteria about that. There are three places you can go to, gen broadly speaking, for a clinician to provide a riser recliner chair. Um, one would be to us, but it's only for um, part of an active, um, proactive management plan for somebody who has chronic edema or lymphedema, who is really concordant with an active management plan. So um, if it's a palliative thing, we, we wouldn't be authorising it from our budget. If the patient's refusing to go to bed or refusing compression, 
um, if it's um, chronic edema as a result of health issues like um, end stage heart failure, for example, um, that wouldn't come from our budget um, either. We wouldn't authorise it if somebody's got um, pressure damage to the sacrum either. Um, nor would we authorise it from our budget if it's for a functional need, so they needed to help them stand up as well. If you need it for a functional need, you'd be referring to occupational therapy for that. And if you need it for all round general health needs, so maybe end of life, maybe they can't breathe in bed because of um, serious COPD, um, maybe they've got heart failure and the like, that would become under health needs and you'd be looking to ordering that yourself out of the district nursing budget um, and getting your CDL to authorise that. So only refer to us for a right of a recliner chair if it's as part of an active management plan for somebody with complex leg chronic edema lymphedema stuff. OK, so I want to share this document with you. Um, this is uh, the updated version of something that's currently on our website. Um, We've renamed it because to me it sounds more sensible to call it an equipment formulary. I think we're all used to formularies and know that this sort of basically contains your choice of um, of a pressure relieving equipment that is out there. Um, currently on our website it is called Pressure Redistributing Equipment, a guide for community clinicians. Um, I don't know how many people of you are aware of it out there, but um, hopefully now um, with a renaming and an updating, um, uh, you'll, you'll find it uh, quite useful. So this document here, we've um, put together um, a selection of documents that we'll talk about later on. Um, so there's the cushion selection guide and the mattress selection guide and the guide to um, uh, heel um, protectors um, all part now together. Um, they were previously separate documents and now they're <clears throat> brought together in this one document. So the equipment formulary, we call it. Um, so I just wanted to um, walk you through this, this document so that you know how to use it, you're aware of what's in it. Um, because this really is your Bible for pressure relieving uh, equipment. Um, on the front here, you have a summary of all of the contents. Um, there are cushions, mattresses and um, heel protectors. Um, and in this top table, um, it tells you um, these are the ones that if you've got a pin that you can order yourself without authorization. So basic foam cushions, the repose things, um, overlay mattresses, uh, repose mattresses, etc. And then in this box down here are the things that you need to request through us through tissue viability. Um, uh, so if you um, go on to NRS and you try to order some of these things yourself, uh, you may actually be able to do that, but it won't go anywhere um, because it goes through to a different authorization. It sort of disappears off into um, uh, an inbox that nobody um, it, it looks at. It's not accessed by anybody. Um, so you may think that you've um, ordered it yourself, but you won't have done. So if you want one of these, really your only way of getting it is to complete an equipment request form, and we'll um, go into that a little bit later, um, and request them from us. Um, so that's helpful that they're divided on the front there. Um, some key things to consider before choosing your um, equipment, um, making sure that you've got the patient's consent, that they understand that this is on loan and that they shouldn't sell it on eBay afterwards. And that does happen. I have been to a nursing home in Banbury to discover um, a tally quattro that belonged to NRS that they had bought off eBay. Um, so some information there for you. OK, so then we go into the, the main uh, bulk of this document, um, a section on cushions. Um, there's guidance here on um, um, selecting um, pressure relieving cushions to go with rise of recliner chairs. There are complex issues around that. So if that's what you're doing, please do read that section there. And then it goes through each um, item of equipment that's available on the formulary. Um, there's a picture of it so that you can see it um, and um, some information about things that you need to consider. So um, patients who it might be appropriate for, um, how long they last in this circumstance with the foam ones. Um, and they will always have the dimensions and the maximum patient weight limit will be there in kilos and stones. So as you can see, the foam cushion is used for low risk patients with no pressure damage who can move their position and get up independently or may have insufficient padding on seating at home. So it may be a hard kitchen chair or something they're sitting on. Um, uh, yeah, and some information about that. Um, other cushions, we have the flow for 
Foam Ultra 90. That's a mixture of um, foam and gel cushion. Can be used for patients at high risk and up to category one to two pressure damage. Um, but people need to be able to um, uh, move and change their own position or, or, or um, yeah, without assistance. Um, and more details about that cushion there and its dimensions and weight limit. Uh, there is the Repose Light pre-inflated cushion, information about that um, and any cautions as well. So with the Repose Light here, you can see that you have to check regularly for any signs of deflation. There are markers on the strap um, that you use to measure the width of the cushion. And if the cushion exceeds those markers, then it's deflated somewhat. Um, and some advice about not storing it in cool temperatures when it looks deflated. Um, then we move on to the Repose Inflatable Cushion. Um, this needs to be authorised by tissue viability. This is your old um, repose cushion that you have to actually actively pump up using the, the canister. Um, then the Roho cushion uh, and the Vicare cushion, which is a new addition. You won't find that on the old um, pressure redistributing equipment, a guide for community clinicians document. Um, it is now available on um, NRS and you can order this from us already. And there's the information about that there and Starlock cushions afterwards. Then you move on to mattresses, very much the same thing. There's a foam overlay mattress that goes on top of a normal mattress. The uh, Premier Maxi Glide non-powered is a replacement mattress um, suitable for patients up to high risk with no pressure damage and who can move their position independently. This is a bit of a change um, in the previous guide we were saying you can use this for people with up to or some people up to category two pressure damage um, who could move their position independently however yeah we've done a bit of a risk assessment on that and thought that actually there are people that um, with category two pressure damage that um, you, you wouldn't at all put on, on this mattress. And so we've changed the guidance now to say um, if you've got any pressure damage, this mattress wouldn't be appropriate for you. Uh, so that's a different thing. Um, repose topper. Soft from soft form premier active hybrid mattress. This is a foam mattress with a dynamic inside to it. If you turn the electrics off, you've still got a pressure relieving mattress underneath you, albeit only the like the, the foam mattress we've just mentioned, but it will be something. So if you have somebody in a high risk area of, of um, power cuts, this would be a good one for them. Um, but also um, it's a it's a good in between mattress. So if you've got somebody at high risk, uh, intact um, skin, but um, unable to have their position changed overnight, so they're immobile overnight, this is a good mattress for these people. And then there's the full dynamic, the Tally Quattro mattress that we've got there. There's uh, the Roho mattress um, that is suitable for people with multiple um, pressure damage. Um, and particularly, this is useful for very thin and bony people with multiple, you know, when you get people that's got, you know, it's on their elbows, their shoulders, their sacrum, their spine, you're getting red marking. Um, Roho mattress is good for that. And then there's the bariatric options. We've got a bariatric foam and the bariatric uh, full dynamic mattress, the Sentinel. Moving on, we move on to the heel and foot protectors. When to use them, um, the different forms that are out there. So repose boots wise, I hope people are aware that we have two sorts of repose boots now. You can see here, hopefully, that there is um, the repose boots, uh, the standard one that you get when you order, have got these magnetic straps on them. Um, they're not suitable for use with people who've got a pacemaker. So the old ones that don't have the magnetic straps are still available. Um, uh, and yeah, so this will just tell you a little bit more about the heel lift boots and repose boots and how to use them and when you would need which. A repose boot um, uh, in particular is only suitable for wounds on a heel. Um, it's that little cup at the end of the boots that is the important bit. Um, the rest is just sort of support and, and soft support, but it's the, the offloading part of the heel that is the key thing of the heel of the repose boot. So they're only suitable for people with, with um, heel issues. If you've got a problem with your malleolus um, or the outside of the foot, then um, a repose boot wouldn't be suitable. And this is when you'd be looking for the heel lift boot. 
and um, these are the pictures of the heel lift boots here and there's some information about how you fit, fit them properly um, and use the pieces of foam um, to um, in, in different ways to offload different parts um, of the feet and the like. Uh, there are some other documents that I can share with you that you will be able to use to help, um, let me just change this, decide which cushion to select and which mattress to select. You may have seen the mattress selection guide and the cushion selection guide. And these are flow charts that help you work out out of the bits of equipment that are in the formulary, which one is going to meet your patient's needs. So here, for example, can everybody see that? Can somebody put their microphone on and tell me that they can see the flow chart mattress selection guide? Yes. yes. Perfect, excellent. Whew, something's working. Um, okay, so like I said, there's one for mattresses and one for cushions and I've uploaded these as well. They're available on our website, but I've uploaded these as well onto the bite size training folder for this sort of session. Now, what people often do when they're choosing equipment is they think about the category of pressure damage that somebody's got and they choose their piece of equipment based on that. But there are actually three factors that interplay with each other that you need to take into consideration to work out which is the right piece of equipment. And they're, they're demonstrated here by these three different coloured boxes. So can you see at the top, you've got the blue coloured boxes. I don't know if my mouse is showing up here is moving along. You've got the blue coloured boxes, which are your Braden score. So the level of risk from your your, your risk assessment um, of somebody. So somebody with a mild risk would be in this column on the left hand side here, then moderate, high and severe risk. So that's one thing, your Braden score that you take into consideration and the level of risk. The next thing is the purple squares lower down. This is about what pressure damage somebody has, whether they've got no pressure damage, they've got up to and including category two pressure damage, or they've got more significant pressure damage, two, three or four pressure damage. And the third thing you need to take into consideration is how somebody moves or how frequently they have their position changed. So if somebody moves independently, excellent um, if they are they able to move so this is the mattress are they able to move in bed themselves yes or no um, and for how long are they sort of immobile so for example you could have somebody let's going into this column here who is high risk uh, maybe they've had a stroke, they've got no sensation down one side and they might not have any pressure damage, but they're unable to change their position in bed at night. This person, even with no pressure damage, um, they're high risk, no pressure damage, they can't move in bed. So you come down to this box here, very limited or no ability to move in bed, and that takes you on to probably this person needs to be on a premier active mattress. You might have somebody at high risk, no pressure damage, but they can wriggle around in bed. Now, moving in bed is not turning from side to side. It can be wriggling and changing their position slightly. It only needs to be like the 30 degree tilt thing. Um, if they can change their position in bed, then they would be all right on a repose mattress. Now you might have somebody that has category two pressure damage, is able to move in bed and they will therefore be OK on a repose mattress. Or category two can't move in bed, needs to be on a premier active. It's very tricky to make these flow charts work perfectly because there are so many factors to take into consideration, but hopefully these will help you think risk, pressure damage, are they able to move and to see when you might need to step them up or step them down onto something else. So the severe risk or category three or four pressure damage will take you into needing your tally quattro. So you could have somebody that has um, uh, um, no pressure damage, but has a very, very severe risk um, and they would therefore need to be on a tally quattro. Or you could have somebody with um, category two pressure damage, high risk, that would be fine on the Premier Active. So hopefully these will help you make your, your, your choices in between them. 
a little bit of information there. So that's the mattress selection guide. Let me just stop sharing that one with you. And then we'll have a little look at the cushion selection guide, which was here a minute ago. Here we go. So very similar sort of thing. Mild risk, moderate risk, high risk, severe risk, all based on your Braden. The category of pressure damage that you've got there and whether people are able to move. And, and added in here is the sitting for long periods of sort of time. So for example, here, you might have somebody at high risk who has no pressure damage, but is unable to walk, stand, um, and um, is sitting for long periods of time that may need to go on to a rojo. So they may not have pressure damage, but because they are sitting for long periods of time, it takes you down to this sort of like rojo area. Um, if you have somebody at mild risk, we find a lot of people just go, oh, repose cushion is, is, is the standard thing to put people on. Actually, if you've got people on mild risk, then uh, and no pressure damage and they're able to move and we do get people being discharged from hospital like this, they will be absolutely fine on a foam cushion. So do not forget those. Even people at moderate risk with no pressure damage who are able to move, they could go on to the Flow Foam Ultra 90 cushion, which is a, a solid cushion. It's got foam and gel inside it. Um, so don't forget those other cushions that are there and do use these flow charts to help you work out what you what you need for those. So when you are ordering equipment from us, uh, from current slide, is that better? Um, you need to complete an equipment request form. So we have two referral forms for our different streams, if you like. So there is the tissue viability referral form, which is for wound advice, um, pressure ulcer management advice, uh, chronic edema advice, um, etc. Leg ulcer advice. Um, and then if you're after a piece of equipment, it's the equipment request form. Um, often we get emails from people going, oh, I'm not sure which piece of equipment um, I need. That kind of delays things and it certainly will be delaying things in the coming weeks when we are really incredibly down to bare bones service wise. Uh, if you're not sure what you need, but you know you need some thing just fill in the form to the best that you can because it gives us most of the information that we need to be able to work out or help you work out which is the right piece of equipment and we deal with those on the day that it arrives so if you're not sure fill in the form put as much information in as possible send it off um, we don't get these by fax anymore these need to be emailed into us um, and you send them to the preferably the tissue viability admin address that's on the screen but if you're emailing from an NHS net you will need to send it to the net address um, and if you need the form um, then download it from our website um, so the, the address is there. Hopefully you all are familiar with our website and you'll find that form in two places. You can go to the referrals tab and there is a link there or you can go onto the resources tab and under blank documents, you'll find the blank form there. So just a word, some people have a few problems um, just managing the forms. You need to save the blank form first before you fill it in. So save it to a folder or your desktop or whatever and then fill it in, save it again, and then send it as an attachment on an email to us to these addresses. Some please, please, a plea, please, um, about how you fill in the forms. Please, please, please do put your mobile phone number on it. If we've got a query, we will need to call you to discuss it. If, if we go through the hub, it takes an awful long time to get hold of you. Please put a mobile phone and then we'll quickly be able to ring you up and go, are you sure you meant this? Or do you think this bit of equipment would work? Um, when you are choosing your time delivery for it, um, the standard delivery is five days. So if you put ASAP, we will put it as five days. Um, it's perfectly OK to ask for it urgently if that's what you need. So clinically, if you go and see somebody and you go, blimey, that cat two is deteriorated to a cat three overnight. I want something in here, you know, quickly. 
put same day on the form. You know, as long as we get the referral by, well, the cutoff for ordering is quarter past four. So I would say the very latest four o'clock, preferably a little bit before then for us to process it. But if we get it in that time, we will be able to do a same day delivery or even a next day. So, but just be reasonable, you know, that the same day stuff costs more than the five day, but if clinically you need it, then do ask for it. Just put your rationale down there, that's fine. Oh, what I haven't put on there as well is please do, you know, weight is important. There are weight limits to cushions and mattresses, repos, for example. So that can make quite a big difference. And if you're looking at cushions and chairs, it can be very helpful for us to know, particularly when we're looking at things like Rojos and Starlocks and the like, the dimensions of the chair. Um, if you haven't managed to measure it, but you know that a repos cushion fits in it perfectly, you could just say that because then we will know what will fit in that chair. So please do fill in those other bits of the forms as well. Little bit of a note about other things because it's not just about uh, mattresses and cushions and heel protectors. Um, it is also about other bits of um, pressure relieving equipment. Um, a derma we have used quite a lot in the past and I don't know if people have picked up yet that a derma is no longer in production. Um, what is being stocked now via e-procurement is um, um, something very similar to a derma. It's called Dermis Plus Prevent. Um, there's a larger range than this, but to make things sort of easier, these are the things that are on e-procurement. They're exactly the same products as the Aderma range, so the 10 by 10 square pad that's in uh, a thin one, 0.3 centimetres, and then one that's 1.2, the longer strips, the heels, um, and a sacrum one. They are now there, and those are the order codes for you on um, e-procurement to have those. They are better, I would say, than Aderma in terms of their robustness um, in that the Aderma used to rip particularly if you cut it into a, a donut or something like that it would rip quite easily this doesn't rip as much um, but um, please do send us any feedback that you have um, on that once you start using it so just to confirm this is not to be prescribed this is a medical device you don't prescribe a pressure relieving mattress or a pressure relieving cushion um, it's a medical device and it should be um, ordered through e-procurement um, and uh, uh, not prescribed on fp10 okay so when you do get to have a little look at our um, currently draft equipment formulary, you'll see that it, it covers, you know, 90 percent of what your patients need. Um, but there is always stuff that isn't covered um, on a formulary. There is always some sort of bespoke stuff. Um, if you find that what is in formulary is not meeting your patient's needs, again, send an equipment request form and just say, you know, I think we need something different for this reason, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it might be um, you've got somebody um, in a, um, a, a large chair, somebody bariatric in a large chair that the normal cushions wouldn't fit and that you need a bespoke size cushion for that, a bespoke size Roho. Um, we, that's fine, we will look at that and, um, and we will help uh, work out what the right piece of equipment is. Um, we then have to do a special order on that um, via um, NRS and it, and it doesn't happen quickly, okay? That happens in about a six week sort of turnaround. We have to put in a special order with the company. Um, sometimes if it's a, if it's a bespoke um, Roho cushion, for example, of a different size, it has to get made in America so it can take six weeks to come um, in that situation that you will need to um, put your own interim management plan in place to try and minimize the risk there um, um, until we get a bespoke piece of equipment um, sometimes people have pressure damage in odd areas of the body um, and that the current stuff might not um, might not manage and we might need to find something else so do get in touch with us and again the quickest way to do that is on the equipment request form um, sometimes we have people sort of not, not concording with various bits of equipment. We don't provide pressure relieving equipment on the basis of comfort and personal choice. We do it on the basis of clinical need. Um, but um, if there's somebody that's struggling to cope with a piece of equipment and typical things that this might be around is the is the the boundary between the um, normal equipment and the bariatric equipment. So people who are larger and need a larger bed and a larger mattress, 
and they don't have the full bariatric weight. Sometimes that's a tricky thing because the bariatric mattresses that we got are designed for really very heavy people. And if somebody is large but not that heavy, sometimes I find them very hard and uncomfortable. Um, and they may sort of be in between the, the normal equipment that you can get and the bariatric equipment. And it may be that we have to do something bespoke for that. So, um, but it needs to be clinically rather than just um, uh, a, you know, a, a comfort thing and I just, I don't like it. Um, we often have to do a lot of work with other members of the multidisciplinary team on people with complex needs. So people with complex postural needs. Um, uh, often we have to have um, help from our um, occupational therapy colleagues um, on posture um, and uh, positioning and, um, and also um, on manual handling techniques. Um, uh, uh, people with disabilities maybe, um, people with contractures, um, with um, physios. Um, uh, yeah, so there may be quite a bit of work that, that needs to be done um, in the MDT together with that. Um, if you are looking at somebody in a, a nest that you find that their, their seating posture is really poor um, and that's contributing to their pressure damage, you may be needing to refer via the single point of access for a seating assessment from an occupational therapist. Um, you'll need to be fairly specific about the urgency of that, whether they've got deteriorating pressure damage or pressure damage that's you know, active as a result of their posture. Um, and that that needs to be um, seen urgently. Um, so yes, there are often sort of complex things um, around this. OK, so um, please do. I would refer you back to our website. I've tried to pinpoint some of the uh, key documents that we've got available to help sort of like guide you, but there is more out there on our website. So on the website, there is an equipment tab. If you go on to that, there are other key bits of equipment like um, the criteria for putting a hospital bed into a residential home, the full criteria of um, rise of recliner chair from tissue viability are there. Like I said, the um, uh, cushion selection guides and the mattress selection guides and the like, uh, they are, are there as well. Um, and there's, there's more information um, on all of those um, aspects, things like setting up row hose, um, um, yeah, different cushion sort of set up. So do please go to our website for some more um, advice there. Um, do uh, email us. Um, and there are um, the reps from the companies are extremely um, helpful as well. So if you um, CDLs will know this um, for some time now, you've been needing to arrange locally within your localities um, training with the company reps on how to set up Roho cushions and Starlock cushions. Um, and um, those reps will be very helpful to you. They, they are gearing themselves up fully to provide advice um, over teams and virtual advice. We do have some videos on setup and some written instructions on setup of cushions and the like. Um, so, and but as do the company. So if you're having particular problems with a certain mattress, for example, so sometimes people on Tally Quattro mattresses find them a bit uncomfortable and there are different settings that you can put them on. So you can have comfort settings on the Tally Quattro mattress um, and the, the company might be able to talk you through how to do that. Um, you will also find um, advice on um, how to cope with different bits of equipment um, in the event of a power cut and all of that's on, on our website. Um, so any specific um, advice that you need on a particular piece of equipment, do approach the companies, um, but do again look, as I said, into the document that I've not been able to show you, which is annoying, um, the equipment formulary um, that has more information on that.